Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the MX Endurance Podcast, where we look at everything that's been happening in the world of endurance sports. My name is Tim Ford, and I'm joined by the penultimate legend, the sexy shepherdess, the filet mignon himself, sexy's voice in triathlon, James Bale. I gave you a fourth nickname, mate. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you going? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm actually feeling quite um, quite positive. But, you know, I, I made a mistake there. I made quite a big mistake in the last few months. And uh, and I, I I feel I need to share this uh, this error with as a as an endurance as a coach of endurance sports and someone that's been in the triathlon world for a long time. Sometimes it's very hard to to to, to see what you're up to, isn't it? You know, and and as you know, I stopped doing triathlon training for triathlon properly sort of last year sometime, and I've been focusing on running. And I've been getting knee pains, and I've been just feeling shit all the time. And I I, I neglected to give credit to the amount of flexibility and cross training the idea of training for a triathlon two days a week to two two times a day every week all the time gives you okay. and i just started running and i've been seasoned up mate and i've finally finally taken it upon myself to do some flexibility work and i'm feeling top of the fucking world how are you bro i love to hear it mate i love to hear that my wisdom for many many weeks goes finally like I planted that little seed in the back of your head. I was like, oh, I'm doing mobility training. And, you, and you've thought, yeah, what a fucking waste of time. And then a couple of weeks later, it's like that seed has started to blossom and, and the, the 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 sprout has shot up. And then it's it's, it's like mobility training. Now, that's a good idea. That's something that I could get behind. Well, no. What I noticed was that when I was when I was doing lots of tri training with the running, the swimming, the cycling, and then doing strength work on top of that, you know, I didn't really need to stretch because you kind of get that stretch in and around the workouts you're doing and the warm downs and stuff and and I could always touch my toes but now I, I started to notice over the last few months that I'm I was good foot away from me to touch my toes wow. suddenly I was kind of just seizing up so I've been doing it been doing a bit of work on that mate and I can I can downward dog like a master now ah oh, mate I bet you are the master of downward dogging uh, you know what I did yesterday, <laughs> or what I've done the last couple of days, actually. We, I know that everybody's been, everybody keeps okay. messaging me going, please, Tim, give us another injury update. Like, we love it. We froth over it. Uh, I'm running, mate. I'm running without walking. I'm running, running again. And it good work. feels and is that, is that, good. Yeah, is that like a decent pace kind of thing? You can you can do a good run without, without walking at all. So I did 14K on Sunday at 4.59 pace. Pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I did my first little bits of intervals where I was doing, I think it was one minute like fast, fast-ish, which I think I was doing like 3.45 to four-minute pace. And then four minutes medium, which was at about 4.25 pace, and then five minutes at about 5.10 pace. And I did four of that, and the foot's holding up. So I think it's uh, feeling pretty pretty optimistic, mate, that maybe I can actually start the, you know, not I'm not just going to get back to running like 16 at hundreds at, at 3.30 pace or anything, but... Uh, I think it's time to start maybe um, getting serious about the run training again, which is really exciting for me. It's been a very, very frustrating period. So good to see. And it, it, it is, it's that point, right? Where you, you sort of, you, you do the, you do the rehab, the run walk stuff as much as possible. And then I, I literally got to the point where I'm like, I just need to rip this band aid right? And have a try. And worst happens is it blows up a little bit. I'll stop. So you're running and you're so paranoid, right? You, every, every time you feel anything, like, Oh, is that it? Mm. Oh, have I gone to like, you just, and then you finish. You're like, oh mate, I've been there. I've yeah. Been there. So I've done three three just runs now. This I did one on a Sunday, Tuesday, and yesterday, and every single time I've pulled up, fine. Like again, I, I keep ice in the foot afterwards. I've just, it's just a habit I've gotten into for the last fucking four months at this point. But yeah, I'm really really happy with how things are shaping up. And I'll tell you another thing though. Again, this is now I guess a training update. My coach Reese, some people know Reese Barclay is my coach. He's had this thing every week where every Saturday he's been giving me this long ride and it's just been getting longer and longer every week. And it's fine, but it's like, I don't mind a long ride, but it got to where I do my, where I do intervals, there's a 40K park in Sydney and it's, and I do all my intervals there because there's no traffic lights, no cars. And it, it's, it's perfect for intervals, right? It, it's ideal. But this ride is now 180 kilometers and it means I've got to do this fucking loop like two full times or something tomorrow. And I'm I'm legitimately dreading it a little bit, to be honest. I'm like this this is gonna be hideous. Like actually, actually hideous. And I look at my like, fuck 180 is a long way to go. How do people run a marathon after that, mate? Suck it up. You know, I watched this week. You know, I watched, I think it was yesterday. There was some geezer on a bike doing uh, down in the TT position, and there was this fucking drone like absolutely spinning past him with the uh 
with the Fleetwood Mac song playing. Was it a chain? I tell you what, and, you can't... and I think I think there was there was there was a moment of abject fear in the eyes of the rider as the drone went in front of him. I think I picked that up. Did what did it feel like having a having a drone whip across your face that close? Yeah, I'll be honest. So that when that that it, it's funny that what thirteen second video took about an hour to actually capture, and I rode that straight probably thirty times. And the drones like they're not quiet; they make a lot of noise. And every other time, it had just sort of sat. I could you could tell it was around you. And then that one, it just went straight across me. And I mean, like, you're seeing it. It's it's pretty close. And it, there was a moment of, oh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck. yeah I, saw, I, I saw the movement in your facial expression. I couldn't really see your eyes, but I could see this kind of, you know, you saw your muscles twitch. It was like, mm. oh, he shat himself. Yeah. <laughs> he did tell me. I'd that like it... to have seen it just career into the side of your head, to be honest, and just well, wipe you out. I was warned that if it does hit you, it's just like being hit with a tennis ball. I was like, ah, oh, that's all right. I've been, I've been hit with worse things than a tennis ball before. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, again, it, uh, this is what I mean though. I, I've said it a lot and I've been quite vocal about this recently about, I think that all, all triathlon contents looking a little bit samey, uh, stuff like this, mate, like how, like, you know, we have the ability to, to use this incredible technology now. I don't understand why there's not more of it in triathlon. Like no, that really, one clip looks so I saw cool, the, right? the other video where, where she's diving into the pool. Yeah. And that's, that's banging as well, you know, cause it just comes alongside and they've timed, timed it so that as the drone passes, she dives in. It's a hell of a shot. Well, he was, so again. And um, then traces down the pool next to her. We, the, so we were talking and we did that, that shot that I used, we did, it was like a bit of a test just to make sure it could work. And since it did, we're like, okay, where can we go now to actually do this? That's not a fucking car park, right? Like, and we were talking that there's some coastal roads in Sydney, for example, there's one in particular, it's called the Sea Cliff Bridge. I think it's down south of Sydney and it's, it's a raised bridge that just goes across like the, the coast. And he was saying that what we could do is we could get you riding across this bridge. I'll sit on the thing with my drone and we'll have the drone like literally loop under the bridge and shit while you're doing it with the waves crashing and everything. And I'm like, my God, this sounds so good. And like I said, it, it's it's good to see that, uh, you know, and again, this is the thing, Michael, the guy who did it, Michael Kadori at Kadori, uh, I'd recommend you guys go check him as a Phoenix athlete. He's not a triathlete. He's a content creator. He works in parkour. He works in all other sports, and what he's saying is, he's like, "This is the norm." Like, he's the he's the chap he's the chap that jumped off the start line at some um, sub seven sub eight, wasn't he? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, correct. But that's yeah. what I mean. Like, it's it's important, and I, and I guess <laughs> let's bring it to triathlon a little bit, right? You can see the PTO go. We need to look outside of triathlon to try to make this sport better, which I agree with. And then they've gone golf. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. You picked the wrong. You picked the wrong sport. Yeah. Like. Yeah, pick, yeah. Pick something other than golf, but that, that's what I mean. Like, I, I like to. I like the fact that we're now starting to see. Yeah, golf, golf, and Phil Liggett. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't the modernization, like uh, tsunami we were expecting. But this is what I mean. I think if we start to see more more people from outside of the sport come in and try to do stuff, that's when we're going to see stuff that that is is different. And I think that's what I've sort of been touching on a lot lately. Is we need to see people starting to push the envelope uh, envelope forward a little bit. Um, and and yeah, I mean yeah, a little shameless plug for my Instagram. Go check it out uh, at T four fourteen. You'll see this little clip. But then go and have a look at what Phoenix has been doing this week because like we've got some really cool stuff. I mean I don't know. If, so one of the athletes will again a triathlete will uh, they will film with in Asia. There's behind the scenes footage of the cameraman wearing rollerblades and a guy behind him pulling him on a string so that he's rolling along while the, the runner is coming along the track and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty interesting because no, you know, normally the, the the person runs with the gimbal thing next to them and stuff. And I think we're just seeing some, yeah, some some new and interesting, different dynamic shots and stuff like that. So yeah, that's no, good. Mate, drones are drones are changing the game with the <laughs> shots you can get. Ah, uh, mate, hundred percent. Like again, I've said a lot that rad race stuff. You look at the content they push out; it's so cool. It's so cool, and that's all FPV drone stuff where they're literally just following the cyclists and weaving through them and everything. It's yeah, I think I think it's really cool, and I mean, there's been a lot of discussion around using drones instead of motorbikes. Uh, even this week, I think I saw who was it? Who was it that was talking about this? I saw there was a discussion about. I can't remember, but yeah, game's changing, mate. Yeah, man. You know what, a podcast. You know, well, do you know what isn't changing is that this podcast is the official podcast of MX Endurance, the world's premier endurance sports community, created by four-time world champion Chris McCormack. Mate, where are we going to start this week? Where do you want to get started? Well, how about we talk about some race results first, shall we? Or do you want to start with the juicy doping story that I found that I, I teased? Ah, uh, yeah. Go on. Let's do that. I'm interested. You told me not to Google this. 
It's, so, this is new to me. This this is uh, buckle in, buckle in, ladies and buckle up, buckle in, whatever you want to call it, ladies and gentlemen. Because if you haven't seen this already, you are in for one fucking hell of a wild ride with this this doping story. A New Zealand runner called Zane Robertson has been given an eight year ban for uh, testing positive for using EPO. Now you might be thinking eight years that's quite an extreme. Uh, a ban normally it's four years. You're, you would be correct. A, a standard ban, I believe, is in fact four years. The reason that Zane Robertson got given an eight-year ban is because when he got uh, te- when he tested positive and was asked to explain why he was using EPO, he didn't just go, "You're right, you caught me." He uh, he he told a bit of a fib, mate. And not only did it, did he tell a fib, he uh, he started to falsify documents and <laughs> do a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> that he then got found out for. So, Zach, for people who don't know, and I mean, I had never heard of Zen Robertson before at this point, but I believe he is the New Zealand marathon holder. I think he went to the Olympics for the marathon, and he's also gone for the ten thousand meters. He 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 holds a number of New Zealand's uh, national records for running. Again, I don't think that's really significant, uh, but he basically claimed because he lives in Kenya that he went to a clinic. And yeah, I was having a dig at New Zealand being shit at running. Um, he yeah. claimed that he went to a clinic in Kenya and asked for a COVID-19 vaccine and explained to the doctor there that as he's an elite athlete, he can't have anything that has illegal substances in it. I mean, why you'd be saying that about the COVID vaccine is just like, anyway, he then says that a different doctor came and gave him an injection that he believed was the COVID-19 vaccine, but couldn't be sure if it was the same doctor because they were wearing a face mask. And what actually happened is instead of giving him the COVID-19 vaccine, they treated him for COVID-19. And one of the treatments for COVID-19 is what? EPO. Erythropoietin? Yeah. yeah. Apparently. Uh, so he's put in, and he's put in these uh, documents that basically show the doctors who were there and the times and what they said, and they confirmed that they made a mistake. And uh, what is it? The Department of Fair Sport, or the, you know, Fair Sport New Zealand, let's call it, got his submissions, and they thought, we should probably check if this is true, right? So they... Yeah, that's, they that's- Cheeky phone call. Yeah, we should probably check if this is true. Uh, so they went to the clinic in Kenya where he said that he had had this happen. And the I think it was the director of operations is like, firstly, the patient number that he's provided on the paperwork is somebody else. Secondly, these documents are not the documents that we produce. They look nothing like the documents we produce. Thirdly, one of the doctors that he says treat him does not exist. And fourthly, the one who does exist could not have possibly treated him at that time because he was either away or with another patient. So they're like, yeah, nah, I think he's, uh, I think he's been lying to you. So then they've gone. This guy, did he then go on the run? No, <laughs> he, he went on a car. Did he, he steal in, a car? Hopped in one run? of those, the, the station wagons and drives down the motorway like, like OJ <laughs> Simpson. No, I think he's, I think he's finally been like, yeah, okay, you caught me. <laughs> I'm, I mean that's uh that's a unique journey to go on, isn't it? I mean you you are really relying on the on the kind of laziness of the people to receive your documents and forms and excuse to just go. You know what? I believe him. I can't be bothered to ring up. This will be all right. This looks legit. Of course, they inject you with erythropoietin instead of a COVID vaccine. Normal. Normal. I know. Oh whoops! Oh, oh they they were holding us. <laughs> they were holding a syringe of EPO, threatening. They tripped over, and it just so happened to land in my vein. I couldn't stop it. <laughs> oh man! I mean, it's 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 um it's a strange excuse. Many people have come up with many strange excuse, excuses for the presence of EPO in their bloodstreams, though over the years, mate. There have been um there have been several from uh, from tainted steaks to uh tainted steaks i do remember to, the tainted um, steaks to tyler hamilton and his excuse that he had a phantom twin in the womb and uh, and that was why he had uh, failed Wait, drugs test sorry what explain this to me tell me this story well i've read his book i don't the, remember this back in the teeth. do you not remember this where no. he said um he said there was, there was something about how when he was born there was a phantom twin in uh, in his mother's womb, which had been the reason for some sort of genetic thing that meant he triggered a drugs test. I can't remember off the top. Of it. it was a long time ago I read that book, but uh, that is the the weirdest excuse I think I've heard. Or it might that might have been the excuse for um, for the testosterone. There was the, he used the phantom twin excuse for, to cover up something. Anyway, see. 
story time with James Bale. I know my <laughs> shit. Not that not that our listeners would ever do this, but I love the thought that there's some because let's be honest, I think there's probably more doping in age group triathlon than there probably isn't. Pro, not that there probably isn't, but you know, it's probably quite prevalent in in amateur triathlon i love the thought that someone's listening to this like literally in the process of writing out some fake report for our doctor or, or alternatively being like hmm if i ever get caught that's going to be my excuse i'm going to i'm going to say oh they gave me the wrong injection my ass for the covid19 vaccine here's a just don't dope guys like it's not that it's not that important right it's just sport you know i understand that there's some money involved with cycling or whatever but come on now i mean i don't know i, I listen yeah, to totally just <clears throat> just don't do it you know I was listening. And then you can look yourself in the mirror, and you can you can go to sleep at night. And in twenty years' time, you'll know what you were able to achieve, as opposed to wondering what you were able to achieve without the substances that you put in your body. I heard you know, Joe was interrupted you. That's right. Joe was talking on his podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he was basically saying that in the last few years, there's almost been no testing. Like, there's no out of competition testing. And he said only I think at two races or three, he got tested in Kona. I was there when he got tested in Kona, and he said maybe Wales, but not South Oh South Africa and Wales. Yeah. Not, like there's just not that much testing happening in triathlon at the moment. And again, it's just like this no, is another and example. They don't, they don't have the biological passport either, do they? They just have, they do, they do just testing and the half life, and they rely on the half life of the drugs to still be there if they're in the system. They don't have the biological passport they do in cycling where they map your levels over a period of time and then they look for discrepancies and it's not, it's not quite that um, sophisticated in triathlon yet. Mm. I, oh God, I, I have this fear one day that they're going to start like cracking down right? and suddenly we're going to see all these people have uh, been pinged. I hope not. I bloody hope not. Um, what was I going to say though was, yeah, I think it's just another example of we, we can see that professional racing is an, is an afterthought for a lot of like for Iron Man where if it was a re- if they were really truly seeking a professional sport, they'd be a lot firmer on this. Whereas you can tell Iron Man's like, whatever, I just do what you want. Oh, we better... Tick the box. Yeah, Always exactly. done some testing. Here you go. There it is. Uh, but yeah, doping. Don't do it. Naughty, naughty. And especially don't lie about it happening in a Kenyan clinic. Uh, I mean, I, I would think I would think that forging medical documents and things is is is, is a, an illegal offence in itself, isn't it? I would assume. I would no. assume that would be, isn't it? I don't know. It's not. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Believe it or not, just because I've studied law for, doesn't mean I, I know every part of the law. <laughs> But if you for if I you forge a certificate from your doctor using that doctor's real name and you're pretending that this has come from them, I'm sure that's illegal, isn't mm. it? It must be. I think I've done that with a medical certificate be. before, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I do, actually, yeah, I, 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 I love saying this on a public podcast, but I remember once I got a medical certificate, and I mean this is this is years ago, but I used to like use the same medical certificate and just change the dates every time I'd like get sick or something. I wanted to take a day off work, and I just like. <laughs> photocopy I, I scanned it i I just you know i do that cut out the thing put it over and then print off the new one i send it in be like yeah oh, uh, that's my medical certificate i've just out of myself i'm gonna get arrested i can hear them knocking on the door <laughs> right now. uh anyway uh, should we talk about some races mate because there's some races that happen and there are some races that happen in well, let's get into it yeah do you want to talk about challenge Puerto veras which happened in uh at the weekend on saturday night 19th of March. Let's do it. It was a uh, 70.3 distance or half Ironman distance race, but obviously it's a challenge. So it's not an Ironman. It's a half iron distance race. Let's call it that. Um, and Tom Bishop came good on the men's side, mate. He obviously heading into the race off from his second place in Miami um, where Jason West had, uh, had passed him on the run. And uh, on the men's side, he went and put a superb bike ride in, which put him well clear of the field and away from any danger. Um, he came first place in 3.45.02, with Matt Hansen in second in 3.50.50, and Mitch Cunningham from Australia in third in 3.52.34. So basically, he built his lead on the bike and then didn't really see any hassle from anyone else through the rest through the rest of the race. Um and uh, it's good to see. It's good to see a British athlete at the top of the, of top of the finishing. Is it? Uh, Are we sure about this? Because I don't, I don't know that it is. Yeah, right. yeah, it's yeah. Bit... Especially when there's an Australian in third. <laughs> but uh, he's doing well. I mean, it's... Um, it's... Uh, I think his move up to middle distance is doing him, is doing him a, a good service because his previous best was his second place to Javier Gomez in Dubai in 2017 at WTCS race. So he hasn't actually won... A pro triathlon in his career and this will be the first one and it's at the middle really so uh, yeah 
That's some, that, that, that actually surprised me. I mean, I've said it a lot recently. I feel like Tom Bishop is one of those guys who's going to benefit from the step up. And again, we always talk about momentum, right? He He's that athlete early season right now who's got the momentum behind it because we've seen him at a number of races. He's always up there or thereabouts. And he's making moves. And yeah, I, I, I'm happy to see it. It's good to see that, yeah, like I said, I think, break, I breakthrough performance. The, the step up is not only... In- in terms of the distance suiting him maybe more, but also stepping away from the structure of British triathlon yeah. where you are working almost in a team and you've got designated leaders who you're going in to look after in races and things, but the ability to step up to the distance, go and look after himself is doing him favors. Um, after the race, he said it was, uh, the plan was to go for it on the bike. That's been my strategy this year. And it was fast on the way out. There was a nice tailwind coming back. It was pretty tough and those hills really got you. So I didn't know what I had left for the run. But I got into a rhythm, took my nutrition, and just tried to keep the cadence up, especially going up the hills. It's great to get the win. So well done, Tom. And then uh, on the women's side, it was we see Biram, who repeated her Miami heroics, but she had to work hard on the bike to establish a gap from defending champion Haley Chura. So into T2, it was the she held her off on the run. Lucy Biram came first in 4:15:52. Haley Chura from the US came second in 4.19.33, and Laura Siddle from Great Britain came third in 4.21.29. So it was a Brit double header, mate, at this race, and very good to see. Lucy coming off her win in Miami, you know, really underlying, underlining the quality that she's uh, she's bringing to the field. Again, I'm going to repeat what I just said. We talk about momentum. And no disrespect, but I, I'd never heard of Lucy Byron really before the start of this year. And now we, we've seen her at how many races has she popped up at now where – this is the third mm-hmm. one, I believe. She did. I know she did. I know she did Miami. She did this one. I think there might have been another one. I can't remember off the top of my head. But the, the man, she's got my attention. And I mean, I'd heard. I think after that Miami performance, there's been a lot of conversations about her and what sort of you know what sort of athlete she is, what we can expect to see from her. And it, it seems like that everybody seems to be on the money, right? She she's got this momentum building behind her, and I hope that she maintains it, and we actually start to see. We'll pop up some more races uh, later in the year and, and be competitive. Laura Siddle, good to see her yeah. start her season there. And Hayley Chura as well, both, you know, both class athletes. So, yeah, good win. But like you say, Lucy, Lucy rode a strong race. I mean, she built that 90-second lead going into T2. Then on the run, mate, to build that 90 seconds into the victory margin that she had, which was nigh on four minutes, is uh, shows that she was looking comfortable. Mm. Um, and she said after the race that race that was a fun race but it was really hard I was chasing Haley on the bike for the first half but caught her coming back I just put my head down and went for it as I know she's a really good runner she is a really good runner but on that day Lucy you ran better than her so well done yeah what two and a half minutes better so that I mean that again let's not that's yeah. not, that's, a, that's a significant gap so I mean not as big as some of the other gaps we're going to talk about later on but uh, a, no. a, big, a, big, no, no. <laughs> a big gap uh, again, great racing. What's next, mate? Where are we going to go to next? Uh, let's have a quick chat about Ironman 70.3 Lanzarote. Does it now, have to be quick? Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be. The, well, can it be as quick as the, the female winner's run, maybe? That would be, uh, that would do it. Should we talk about the men's race or the women's race first? Yeah, let's talk about the, let's talk about the men's race first. Okay, so uh, Justice Nischlag showed his pedigree as an athlete who can swim with some of the best short course athletes in the world. He put almost 10 seconds into the 2022 PTO number one ranked swimmer, Andrew Horsewell Turner. And so said that again. A small lead over the rest of the top 10. He put 10 seconds into the 2022 PTO number one ranked swimmer, Andrew, Andrew Horsewell Turner. He's come out of the water with a small lead over the rest of the top 10. Amongst the front group went to T Ron. Alongside the German Olympian were fellow countryman Rio Borgen, Britain's Josh Lewis, Horsfall Turner, former Ironman 70.3 Lanzarote winner Daniel Beckingard, and four other men. Now, on the bike, it was uh, Madsen who uh, who made his move, and uh, he began to make up the deficit to the front and reached the lead group of Nischlag, Bogen, and Maguire by the 58-kilometer checkpoint. And now Nischlag's hot pace at the front of the race had meant that Beckegaard, who's renowned for his cycling ability, had lost more than 90 seconds off the front, which is a shame to see because mm. um, I I picked Beckegaard to to win this race, but he he looked like he was suffering in the wind and the hills on the bike and probably the heat as well because it's it's not a cool race, this one. With the, over the final 30 kilometres, the front group of four continued to extend their lead. 
By T2, it was clear that unless one of the leading four had gone too hard, the medals would be decided between them. Bogan led out on the run with Nieschlag in hot pursuit as the two Germans got the jump on Meganier and Madsen into T2 to open up a little buffer, the 18 kilometres. Now, the run, mate, it came down It came down to a sprint. Over the last eight kilometres of the race, both Germans seemed to falter as Madsen overhauled Bogan to put himself in a podium position and Meganier began being rewarded for his persistence. As the Frenchman made up almost 30 seconds in the five kilometers to get up to Nieslag's shoulder, coming into the final 400 meters. <clears throat> wow. But luckily, Nieslag had enough in the tank to hold off the fast finishing Frenchman as he took his third middle distance win in four starts. Justice Nieslag won the race in 354.57 with Matthias Moguier from France in 355.13 and Thor Benedict Madsen from Denmark in 356.51. Those are some fast finishing times for a course like this. And it's good to see Nuschlag um, doing what he does. I loved it. It was um, his third middle distance win and uh, many more to come, I think, from this man. I saw a lot from this race. There's there's a lot, I think, that was, again, for me, the, a triathlon tragic quite fascinating. And I want to start with Daniel Beckergaard because I think we both sort of expected him to win this quite comfortably. And... May I, I hope something. I hope he's okay. I hope there's not something going on with Daniel because he's been he's been off what we I guess the, the high level of expectation we have from him when he lines up most times for quite a while now, right? Like we, we you know I think it's was it Elson or seventy point? Yeah, he won that I think, but like it's 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 been a while since we've really seen him dominate the way that we we've, we've seen him do in the past, and I don't know whether it's just early season fitness or if the game is lifted or whatever it is, but. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was a bit disappointed to see his performance. To be honest, um, it's a race. Yeah, you know, I know what you mean. It's it's concerning it's out me a little bit. Characters to see him to see him finishing fifth, sort of six minutes off the winner, um, and it's it's. I mean, it's not out of character to to see that result. It's just the way the result transpired for him. The way he started mm-hmm. suffering on the bike and falling off the back of the group. That's not what you expect to see from an athlete of Daniel Beckergaard's pedigree. You know, you see, he may not win the race, but I don't expect to see him sort of falling back from a from a strong bike group because he is a strong biker in himself. He's you know, a strong a, there's a, there's a, there's a, the, Yeah, indeed. There, there's a lot of illness going around this time of year. I know that very well at the moment. Yeah. And um, who knows? He could be suffering with a little bit of uh, cold or something, or he may just be, you know, marking his way into the year with a peak yet to come. But like you say previous winner of the race and uh wasn't uh wasn't firing uh Thor Bendix Madsen so that's Sif Madsen's uh, brother who we saw Sif come second at uh, Challenge Miami a few weeks ago he's the new one of the new guys on the BMC team great performance to see him like he's he's he again we we always talk about the Norwegians but those Danes are pretty good at triathlon as well so you know good to see him up there thereabouts but uh Justus Nischlag wouldn't have picked him for the win mate like and again no disrespect to to, uh, to him but I think I've always seen him, I guess, as the arena game specialist because what he did a few years ago. And then I saw him do that race, what in uh, Cersei, and he just didn't really feature. And I thought, okay, is he is he sort of between things at the moment, or is he all in on seventy point three or what? And they saw this. And I'm like, okay, fuck, he's he, he's there. And, and again, like let's let's not discredit. Like the reason I asked you to repeat what you said is because I can't actually, I didn't believe, I couldn't believe that he'd put that much time into who I believe is probably the best swimmer in, in long course triathlon. I mean, the PTO tends to agree with me. So fucking hell, like this guy can swim and apparently bike and run. Like it, it, he could be very dangerous this year. If he is now all in on middle distance racing, he's an athlete that we should be paying attention to, I think. Yeah, totally. And if I'm honest, like you say, I wouldn't have picked him for the win of the race either. But when I read that it was his third middle distance win in four starts, that surprised me because mm-hmm. I hadn't been paying enough attention to him where he's been chipping off these victories, you know, these middle distance victories. And um, maybe I should be paying more attention to what he's up to because it looks like he's pretty damn good at this distance. Uh, it... But I do love to see a sprint finish. I, I love the the French guy, Mathias uh, Maguire, getting up to his shoulder with 400 metres to go and uh, and fighting for that victory, but uh, just uh, just had enough to hold on. Well, it's again interesting. If you look at the two results we've spoken about so far, Tom Bishop, ITU guy who... Couldn't quite cut the mustard, so he stepped up to middle distance. He started to have success. He was just Nislag. I'm sorry, I keep butchering that name. It's going to be a different. I'm going to do that thing like uh, Vincent Louis, Vincent Vincent. Uh, I'm going to pronounce it differently every time. But also, uh, you know, short course athlete didn't quite cut the mustard. Has stepped up and is now having 70.3 success. I find it really interesting to see 
the way that like it, this is a very obvious, and we've spoken a lot about it, but you are seeing these guys who can't quite break through at short course going, fuck it, I'm going to middle and, and having almost instant success. And it's, again, I have to be careful with the words I use because it's, I obviously know it's not instant. They, they have put in a lot of work to get there. But it shows me what I've been saying for a long time where I really think we're starting to see this new wave of middle distance racing where you have to almost be an athlete who's gone through a federation or something to 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 be successful in the next five to ten years. But, yeah, mate, it's you're right. I didn't pick him in advance, but now that I see him win, I'm not surprised. So No, uh, no, no. So uh, I think we've got plenty more to come from that man. I think plenty so too. To He's... And I, I, love, I love the fact that he, he, he can be – successful at the arena games and then come and win a middle distance that's the kind of versatility that we love i said the early season prediction last year where i said ash general would win 70.3 was and ultimately she didn't race but i still think I, I was right uh i'm not saying that he'll win 70.3 was this year but fucking hell if he keeps going this way he's he he is one to watch this year i mean again huge risk huge risk to say this after that performance in lanzarote i'm really you know <laughs> taking a gamble but yeah, he he he'd be a guy that I'd, I'm going to be following with um, a lot of interest this year. So it's cool. Do you want to talk about the women's race? I think we should talk about the women's race. Definitely. Now, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rattle through the the blow by blows on this one because it was a race, and it was a race, and it was a race just like any other race until it suddenly wasn't a really a race anymore. Yeah, because uh, you had the contenders up. The front, you know, Kate Curran, India Lee, Elizabeth Corridor, um, Anna Guerra, Juraja, and then Anna Haug, basically all competing for the victory until they stepped onto the run course. And the minute they stepped onto the run course, Anna Haug was on a different level. By just over halfway, the German had put an astonishing four minutes into Lee, making the world rank 32 look like she was fading. But in actual fact, she was running strongly in second. By the last five kilometers, how just seemed to be getting stronger and stronger. And whilst everyone else in the race seemed to be faltering from the previous exertions in the swim on the bike, how just didn't slow down. How much distance do you think Anne Haug had to her nearest competitor the moment she crossed the finishing line? Well, I know in terms that, of miles. I don't know miles. I know kilometers. Uh, but okay, well, go for go for kilometers then. Yeah, give me a guess as to what you think the distance between her and second place was when she crossed the finishing line. Well, wasn't the gap like 16 minutes? So we're probably looking at four or five kilometers. 3.2 kilometers. Jesus, that's fucking ridiculous, right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. So basically, Anne Haug ran, ran a, ran a 116.28 to, to, 116.28 to yes. run all but, outrun all but a handful of the pro men's field. By the finish, Lee was almost 12 minutes back as the Brist started off 2023 well with a second place finish. So the overall results were Anne Haug from Germany in 4.16.47, India Lee from Great Britain in 4.28.38, and Elizabeth Corridor from Italy in 4.36.42. Now, how are you going to beat a run like that, mate? Well, How are you going to do it? So here's the thing, and I, and I want to start, I know this is weird, but before we talk about this one, I want to go back to last year's race because... If you actually look at, I think, Anne Haug's run this year and last year, they're almost identical. She ran, I think, yeah, I think she ran 76 last year, 76 this year. She rode a lot faster this year. I think it was like four or five minutes quicker than the previous year. But what I, I, I'm sort of getting to is Kat Matthews beat Anne Haug quite badly last year in this race, We, you know, when she still ran that same run. It, it shows me, again, we know that Kat's coming back to make her return to race this year and, like, Early season, it, 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 it's pretty exciting, but Anne Haug is certainly not done. And the fact that she seemed to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger as that run went on, plus the fact she seems to have improved her bike a lot on a course like Lanzarote, which is one of the toughest bike courses out there from from all accounts. May again, I know it's early, but looking forward to Kona, like that's an exciting prospect, right? If we've got Anne Haug doing this sort of performance on the most Kona-like course outside of Kona, I guess, or not that it's, you know, it's tough, Uh it's encouraging. And just, again, I find it funny that everybody's been frothing over this run split, but it's like, she literally did the same. She did the same thing last year, like breaking yeah, news. Yeah. And how is a great runner. <laughs> Shocking. Well, it's, it's more, I think it's more the, the sort of strategic nature in which she raced the race mm. to be able to, to stay with the group that she did on the bike and to just be, to be there 
as the run started to be able to just pounce like she did. I think it was um, amazing. Do you think that? And, uh, and I just love, I love, I love that she was 3.2 kilometers back. Do you think I then do. that maybe that this, because what I've just said, if you said she rode with the pack, let's get, again, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Do you think that that makes this race a little less impressive than last year? Because last year she was chasing Kat, you know, all day basically. So she probably had to do a lot more work on the bike. I just spoke about the fact that her bike was faster. If she's riding with a pack, that's what it makes sense. If she's ridden with a pack and then has got off and dropped this huge run, that is again, the same as last year's run. Does that kind of make that this run is maybe less impressive than last year's if she's been with the pack on the bike or do you think it's irrelevant? No, I don't. I think, I think, um, I think maybe athletically, mm -hmm. but not from a race I know, uh, yeah, yeah, not strategically. My perspective, yeah, strategically, you know, it doesn't, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do to win the race on the day. And I think that, uh, I don't think doing that makes it, it makes it any less impressive in my oh, mind because the victory yeah. is the victory. I think, yeah, I, I think I'm looking at this athletically because again, I, all the discussion I've seen around this race, all of it has been around, oh my God, and how I ran a 76 half which I keep saying is what she did last year and people weren't losing their minds like they were this year. But that's what I mean. Like is, is that 76 not equal to last year's 76 because of the fact that she probably had an easier ride this year, I guess is what I'm sort of, again, strategically fucking what she did right from a race point of view, unbelievable. What a performance, but maybe that run isn't as good as last year's just because of the different factors. I mean, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I love it. Yeah, I don't love a 76. Oh. I've not done a 76 fresh. So let alone off a bike. No, 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 nice. no, no. No, no. I I've I've not seen a 120 something for a half marathon. I've I've seen a 130 something, but I haven't seen a 120 something. I've done like so, uh, five seventy you nines, know. I think. I've done five of them or something. So never under seventy nine though. This year, mate. After the after our background, no. I'm gonna go 70, 77, yeah. 76, is 75. That, was that your, the last seventy nine was after that COVID injection you had, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. COVID in in Kenya. <laughs> Kenya. <Yeah. laughs> I'm an elite athlete. You can't give me anything untoward. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's that? The box of EPL. Right. Oh, whoops. Oh, I bumped into you. Sorry. <laughs> Shit, I've fallen into the box of EPO. <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up. Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. We shouldn't joke uh, about such things, James. It's terrible. No, we shouldn't. So we've got a few races to look forward to now. Um, there's one that we'll do We'll do a proper preview for in a few weeks, but I wanted to touch on it because there's been some news that Johnny Brownlee, Gustav Eden, um, Beth Potter and Cassandra Bogrand have been confirmed as starting lineups for the Arena Games in London for the final weekend. Um, and I thought that was interesting because we're starting to see, you know, the kind of names that will will draw more a wider audience and wider eyes. It's a shame that we didn't see these names throughout the series, but uh, always keen to see what Johnny Brownlee can do. And he, Gustav will be there. Um, Beth Potter is the 2022 Arena Games champion, so she'll be good at what she does. And uh, last year's London winner, Cassandra Bogrand, again, will be good at what she does. But I'm intrigued with uh, Gustav and Johnny as to whether we're going to see them be able to step into the arena games and understand it and compete at it or whether we're going to see some of the more you know, some of the people that have been there a bit longer and are a bit more specialist at this uh this particular style of racing and they're going to get blown away is it well you just went like crazy robotic then um i i saw gustav get announced and oh, it was really? like yeah, it was like this this big deal. Of Gustav's announced, oh, you know, reigning world Iron Man world champion Gustav Eden's racing, and it, I don't think it had the desired effect that they were hoping for because it's not like when Lionel goes to the arena games, they're like, shit, how's he going to go? It's like, oh, it's Gustav, a guy who's very good at long course, doesn't seem as good as short. Not that he's bad. I think again, top ten at the Olympics is nothing to sneeze at, but it, it again, I don't think it has that same impact for me. Where I was just like, oh, okay, well, Gustav's a short course athlete. Like, okay, that's fine. Uh, I don't expect to really see him do yeah. much of this just because... I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, like it just doesn't have any... Yeah, like I was like, I, I, again, I I know what you're going for here and I just, I think you've, I think you've missed the mark a little bit. I think it just shows a, fund, a bit of a fundamental misunderstanding from Super League about uh, what excites people a bit. Like it's... No, not for me. Do you think Gustav Eden is still thought of more as a short course athlete than a long course one? 
in my head, he is at least. Like in my head, in my head, still Christian yeah. good stuff, a short course athlete who've done this incredible thing and gone up to long distance and had success. And I know if you look at Gustav's results, people are probably at me going, fucking hell, Tim, he's clearly a long course athlete who keeps, who just needs to give up short course. But it, it, like in my head, they're still short course guys. They're still short course guys. That's their bread and butter. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I don't get that excited about that. I'm I'm excited about Beth Potter and Cassandra. I still don't doing think, it. I don't think, I don't think either of them are going to be very good at this. Me neither. I don't think either of them are going to be very good at this. I think I think they're going to drop the ball a little bit because they're going to come in, and they're not going to have that um, that uh, frame of reference from previous races. And I think there has been a there's been a degree of specialization for some of these arena games, esport athletes. They know how to play the game, and I don't think coming in for the last race as Johnny Brown and Gustav Eden, you're gonna you're gonna be able to learn those tweaks and idiosyncrasies of this style of racing to be able to play the game quite so quickly. So I think they're going to get absolutely battered, mate. If I'm honest. Well, again, let's let's go back to last year's Miami Miami race where Gustav came and did it for the Eagles, and was just might as well not have been there. Like it's, yeah, it's 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 just not compelling to me. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's like I, I feel like I'm fucking Goldilocks a bit with this, or the three. You know, this one's too hot, this one's too cold. Like, I'm always just complaining about one thing or another. But I mean, yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm very keen to see Beth Potter and Cassandra do it because again, I think both of those those women are very good at this, and that makes me excited. Johnny Branley, though, let's talk about Johnny a little bit again. Johnny, one of my favorite athletes, absolute legend. But what's he? Where's he at at the moment? Right, like, I feel like I feel like Johnny's sort of becoming this like slightly gray area at the moment where he's he's still kind of doing short course, but we don't really see him at that many short course events, and he's always like there or thereabouts but not quite at the front anymore and like what do you what do you see what like when you when, as a brit as a proud brit when i said johnny brandon like what what's your opinion on it for him my opinion is he's entered that realm of his career where he's picking his races very carefully he doesn't need to do all the races that someone trying to build that momentum or build that career needs to do in the early stages and he's probably being very cautious but i do know what you mean in terms of like I worry that because he's being a bit picky, he may be missing out on opportunities that, you know, when the end of your career comes, you'll look back and think, oh shit, it wasn't forever. I could have, uh, I should have raced this or raced that or, you know. So, and also he's going to be getting paid quite a lot to go and do this, I assume, because he brings that bit, bit of star power. So, uh, not that I, not yeah. that I know, not that I know anything, but I don't think he's probably getting paid that much. Um, yeah, I don't know that they've cheeky, cheeky little appearance fee. Yeah, Bought maybe him a few grand. Yeah, maybe something like that. Again, I don't know how. Without naming names, I have been trying very hard for a period of time to get a certain athlete into the Arena Games line that I thought would make it a spectacle, and it appears as though Super League have disagreed with me about whether this athlete would make a good. Uh, appearance at the arena games because we have done everything our end to make it happen and it just keeps falling on deaf ears and then i'm literally chasing going is this athlete in or not and then i got a message this morning being like about? i'm i'm not gonna it's just me and you who are we talking uh, about it's just me and you but i literally got a message from super league setup like have you have you guys done the paperwork i'm like i have done everything that has been asked of us and it is it, we have been told by this athletes federation that you now need to do your part and it hasn't happened again it's been weeks since i've got a response and i'm like Oh well, get Gustav Eden in instead. No worries. Like that'll be that'll be fun. And it's a bit frustrating to be honest, mate, because I thought that this athlete would have made a a, a whether they would have been successful or not would have made a spectacle. And it's the sort of thing that I would have loved to see based on what we saw earlier this year. That's the hint I'll give you. Um, All right. But yeah, it's a bit frustrating because again, I feel like it's just the uh, same shit again. Here we go. Never learn the lesson, Super League Arena Games. Let's just keep fucking banging our head against the wall. Anyway. That's enough of that. Talking of Cassandra Beaugrand and uh, and uh, Jonathan Brownlee, they are both going to be heading the fields at the European Cup Catiera. The this Portugal is a Cup the race? second European con yeah European Continental Cup of the year this weekend is racing heads to the Algarve. What promises to be the most hotly contested competition on European soil so far this season? And we've got Johnny Brownlee, Cassandra Beaugrand, and Kate War all Wolf. heading over to race. Wolf, yeah, quite Wolf. I always do that. I always do that. 
it's it's a it's a it's a I, kn cricket I know thing. it's war it's a cricket thing right because yeah. it's Stephen Mark yeah. Ward. Just, yeah 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 that's exactly it that's yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah exactly anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah um Saturday 25th of March the European Cup is held the women's race will begin at 13:45 local time which is uh okay 14:45 central European time <laughs> And 6.45 on the West Coast. The men's race When the big hands at the 12 17 and the small hands at the 3. Time, <laughs> it's 3 o'clock. And 10.30 on the West Coast. All action will be available on Triathlon Live TV. It's good so this will be an interesting race, mate. It is. I mean, you'll be able to watch it if you've got the Triathlon Live membership. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good to see these short course athletes getting a hit out early season, um, these sort of pro conti races, because you'll get a you'll get a steer for how they're feeling and how they're going for the rest of the season. I want to see Cassandra Brogrand have a really good year this year. I really so do. do. I, I think um, so much. Yeah, like, I think she's cool. Let's um, get real really now. Like to see it. Let's get real about Cassandra Brogrand. All right, like she has the potential to be a world champion Olympic gold medalist. Don't know what happened with the last time, yeah. especially the last few years. She's been so hot and cold. With the French Olympics mm. in Paris, fucking get your shit together, Cassandra. It's time. It's time to get that. I that feel like, I mean, I might be missing a few bits and pieces. You know, I had a serious head injury when I did, so I'm, I, I tend to forget things. But I feel like, you know, when we were in Singapore, we watched the end of that Super League race together when her and um, Zafiraz were racing shoulder to shoulder. Yep. I feel like she never capitalized on that momentum. I feel like from that moment, it's been very stop starty for her. I'd really like to see this year be a, be a start because, um, like you say, Paris Olympics, build some momentum through the year, gain some confidence and go and dominate because you can do it. You've got that ability in you. I sat with her at the after party in Singapore after too many beers, looked her deadpan in the eye, deadly serious, and I said, Cassandra, you are going to win a gold medal. Like, you are going to win a gold medal. Now, do not make me a liar, Cassandra. Go and win that fucking gold medal in Paris, because like genuinely, and I'm not just. I, I she she is an athlete that I think, uh, at this point already, or I I could probably name three or four athletes that I think could win the gold medal in in, in Paris, and she's on, and she's probably to me the riskiest one because you just don't know which Cassandra is going to show up. Right? Is it going to be the Cassandra who we know can win any race she goes to really? Or is it going to be the Cassandra that rocks up to the other race where for some reason she's just eighth or twelfth or twenty something? Then you just thought, what the fuck is going on here? Like it's so hot and cold, and yeah, come on, Cassandra Bergrand, you're so good, man, girl, woman. Yeah. Man. Uh, that race is that one, but there's another. There's another race happening in New Zealand that I'm very excited about, which is a World Cup event, I believe. It's not a Conti Cup, but what about that one, mate? Yeah, the New Plymouth World Cup is happening this weekend as some of the top athletes from around the world head to the city on New Zealand's North Island for a race that has been the hallmark of the short course racing calendar for close to two decades. So the gun will go off for the elite women at 11 o'clock local time on Sunday, March 26th. Um, this corresponds to 10 o'clock in the evening UK time and 11 o'clock in the evening Central European time and 1500 in the afternoon West Coast on saturday march 25th for the men the racing will kick off at 13 30 local time on saturday which is half past midnight uk time 1 30 in the morning century european time and 17 30 west coast time on saturday all action will be live on triathlon tv so go and watch it now ask I ask you a question mate? in my thing can i ask you a question yeah, with, with with all the times that you love to read out is this like you pitching for you know at the tone the time will be 12 <laughs> I am. Like, is this what you're doing? Because I it's... want, I want, I want to get into reading audiobooks, mate. Tell you what, reading the clock that's, that's constantly ain't be. the way. Mate, you, you have to be careful now with all the AI stuff. I don't think humans are going to be reading audiobooks for much longer. So, well, none of them have got the the tone that I've got for it. It's true. You know, I could uh, anyway. I've got a note a notes here saying go to go to tab for information. So they the. Uh, Try 24-7 article that I found says the inform athlete of the event is Kiwi, Kiwi Nicole van der Kay. Yep. She won the Oceania Continental Cup here in 2022, and she's on a hot streak at the moment. Uh, other um, elite women racing are Sandra Dode from France, Jazz Hegeland, and Kira Hedgeland. Australia? Sorry, Hedge. Yeah. Hedgeland, From yeah. Uh, Australia are both racing. Gina Serrano who's the Arena Games Montreal winner, and Erica Auckland are two top-ranked Americans heading into the race. 
And we've also got Gwen Jorgensen, mate, making uh, her first triathlon World Cup since she announced her comeback. Mm. What do you think of the women's field? Do you think Gwen Jorgensen is going to fire at this one? It's going to, this is probably why I'm most, not the only reason, but this is one of the reasons I'm most interested about this race because we saw her at that Conti Cup race and I think she finished third. This is probably a slightly, slightly deeper field. So again, I'm, I'm just curious to see where Gwen lands. I'm probably still not expecting her to win. I think we saw Nicole win the, the race in Taupo or Topo. Uh, but I, I guess I just want to see the progression. I want to see, is she, is she improving? It, like, is she getting that race, uh, race craft back? Uh, I hope I hope she does well. Like again, I, I I get nervous when you see these athletes that we love making the comeback that they have a few bad races and they they throw it up, they give it up. So I hope that we still see her continue with the momentum because I do want to see her race this. I want to see her race this whole year really, and and hopefully love it and come back and start doing Kona and winning Kona. Uh, so the, I, I, for a race that's in New Zealand, but it feels to me like there is a fair bit on the line. Uh, so I, I'm going to be watching. Yeah, quite, man. Well, quite fascinated. I think she's taking it very seriously. I mean, she finished on the podium at the Taupo Continental World Cup, which was her first race back. And she's been based out of New Zealand since February, I think. So mm-hmm. she's she's been prepping, prepping in-house for this race. And so I would uh, be interesting to see how she goes. Because yeah. she's not, despite the gap she's taken from triathlon, she's not old. You know she's she's thirty six, so she's still got years ahead of her if she's um, if she can refine that form that she had when she was uh, when winning came came easy. I mean, I, I hesitate to say easy, but it looked like it came easy for her back in the day. So um, I mean, it'd be interesting to. See. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I feel like the way that Gwen used to win, the sport has moved on since then. Like I don't think she's going to be able to go through sit and just drop a run and, and win anymore. Like I don't think that way of racing is going to work for her. I feel like she would have had to have adapted as an athlete. Uh, I I hope she has. Uh, but like I said, she's such a, like, again, I think she's one of the greatest to have done the sport. So I'm excited about her doing this. Like really, Gwen Jorgensen making her return this year is one of the most exciting things that happened in triathlon to me. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. On the men's side, the Maltese Falcon, mate, will be looking to put the disappointment of the WTCS Abu Dhabi behind him. He won the Ocean- Oceana Continental Cup here in 2022, and he's looking to kickstart his his season with a win on home soil. Going up against Hayden will be Tyler Reed, Dylan McCallow, David Castro Fajara. Fajara? Fajara? How do I say that? And I'm not reading it. I can't see. Anyway. <laughs> no. Seth Ryder, Diego Moya, J- Jake Burtwistle. And Tyler Mislachuk of Canada. Amen. Yeah. What do you? Yeah. What do you? What do you reckon? What's going to happen on the men's side? I'd I, I'd like to see Bert Whistle do well, but um, simply because I love the way he's stepping between the distances at the moment. I'm not sure if I'll see it happen, but I'd like to. Um, Tyler, come on, son, you can do it. I yeah. I, I think you know. I'm not. I'm trying to be objective. I'll be. I'll be objective here if I can. I feel like we're going to see probably a two or three man race. Hayden is definitely the man to beat. Uh, again, he, I saw he's saying that oh, people let air out of his tire or something in Abu Dhabi. I don't know that I necessarily buy that, but when he's on, he's fucking third place at the Olympics. You know, he, he's he's a very very good athlete. Tyler was fucking impressive at that uh, Abu Dhabi race a few weeks ago, and if he hadn't got that penalty, I think he probably would have been able to hold on for either you know a, a top five, if not a podium finish. Uh, I feel like it's probably going to come down to those two guys. Jake could be up there. Taylor Reid could be up there. Uh, unless yeah. there's some other name that I'm not immediately jumping to mind, but fuck, I hope Tyler does it. Like, that, let's put the let's put the objective stuff aside. Let's go subjective. I fucking hope Tyler gets this race. Like, he he, the momentum this kid needs, kid, this legend needs. Like, he 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 needs to start having some good stuff go his way. And again, I think we triathlon is such a short memory. Like, Tyler is fucking good athlete, and once he starts to get the momentum, I think everybody will start to remember that. So I I think it's going to be between those two guys. Yeah, Tyler's running well. I know Hayden is a good runner, so I think it's just going to be very interesting to see how the actual race goes down. Is that group going to let Hayden catch up, or is Hayden going to get out of the water with the group? I don't know, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see. So I'm I'm keen to follow this race. Yeah, it'd be cool to see how. It's nice to see a race that Hayden's in that hasn't got Alex Yee in it. If I'm honest, yeah, because we'll be able to see how he races without that sort of um, without that pressure on his shoulder of knowing that he hasn't really beaten you in a foot race in a race 
for some time. So um, it'll be good to see how Hayden responds to that, but also how how Tyler approaches beating Hayden. Because what you can't do, what you, what Tyler can't afford to do if if Hayden catches back up on the bike, is to allow Hayden to build a gap on the bike and attack. Right. So uh, if I was if I was Hayden, I would be looking to do that. One hundred percent. That's how I'd do it too. Whether he whether whether he'd be able to or not will be. I suppose that comes down to the response of the rest of the field. So uh, we will see. But uh, this is one I might watch. Actually, I might um, I might allow myself a late night, make myself a cup of cocoa, and stay up and watch this one. I like that it's actually like reasonable hours for me. So that's pretty good because they're a couple of hours ahead. So it's Sunday morning for me. Nice. Yeah, yeah. You'll be having a nice lie in, and I'll be I'll be up on my eighth ale. Eighth, shouting at clouds eighth bale al cool yeah. uh so that's the races that are coming up are we going to talk about any other races or do you want to talk about the article from mr hemian um not really there, there was a there was a little note there was a note saying that sam laidlow and um patrick lang are going to be challenge facing off at, uh, challenge Oka? grand canary, canary yeah. that's grand in a canary. few weeks though isn't um, it that's yeah it's it's not until the next april 22nd so i was, I was just going to mention it but uh, there was no, I don't think there's any point in going into that in detail yet because we will do a much more in-depth run-in nearer the time. But what I wanted to talk about, mate, was that recently we and you've been discussing the calendar and we? we've been talking about how the PTO have come in and they're trying to create this structured calendar and they're coming up against the obstacles of the existing triathlon. That is that people get injured a lot. Um, people don't race every race. They They target specific races, but also the the point that despite the amount of prize money the PTO are, are putting on the line and the increase from that of Ironman, the pros in the pro field still consider an Ironman victory to have more credence and more prestige to it than a PTO win. Yeah, exactly. So we've been discussing that. And then Tim Hemming putting up... <clears throat> Tim I know Hemming that he gets you nervous, mate. Settle down. It's, to... just, it's just Tim Hemming. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Jesus. Uh, he's not Jesus, is he? <laughs> <laughs> He'll message you. Tim He'll, He'll tweet you saying, <laughs> call me Jesus. On... <laughs> <laughs> 220 triathlon saying, and the title of the article caught my eye because it said, is the pro triathlon racing calendar too busy? Yes. The professional triathlon organization has announced new race dates, but has it mistimed its programming in an already fit to burst calendar? Tim Hemming weighs in. I think he's talking about himself in the third person. Oh, we love you, Tim. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll I'll give you some uh, some bits and pieces from the article. But he says that triathlon has Hawaii in October, albeit only one gender at a time now, and maybe a big European race such as Ross or Frankfurt in July. But with World Triathlon Finals jumping around, there's little that resonates globally. Like um, he's comparing it to Grand Slam tennis and saying that it's a tough act to follow. Mm. He said, um, Sam Renouf, the chief executive of the PTO Triathletes Organization, has made clear that it's a priority to change. The PTO wants to boost the value of the pros, which means building a fan base by driving a year-long narrative that can be supported by compelling content. It's how other sports work. It makes sense. But the PTO is rapidly finding out that delivering a race calendar fit the brief is no easy task. As this edition goes to print, they've only just announced their European Open in Ibiza at the start of May. The U.S. Open in Wisconsin and the Asian Open in Singapore are both in August. There's no word yet on the fourth Open or the Collins Cup, the flagship team event previously run in Slovakia. Those places aren't without issues. The Ibiza race is being run alongside World Triathlon's Long Course World Championship. And while the event logistics work, logistics work, it will cannibalize the World Triathlon professional fields and devalue their worth. August is packed. The US Open is the first weekend and Asian Open a fortnight later. But many pros are eyeing Ironman 70.3 Worlds in Finland a week after in Singa after Singapore. Then the men's Ironman Worlds in Nice takes place on the 10th of September. The PTO has reduced its prize money from $1 million to 600 k on its 100-kilometer open races. And while it's still in excess of Ironman, the MDOT brand retains its cash amongst Ath Cache amongst athletes, sponsors, and fans. From conversations with pros, few would swap a 70.3 world title for a PTO win at this point. Mm. The plan of getting all the best athletes to race each other over multiple times to create these storylines could backfire with racing more disparate than ever. 
unless you're Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden, or maybe both, trying to peak at any of these races involves skipping others. What are your thoughts on that? Because basically, I think he's he is he has been listening to the podcast. Mm-hmm. He's gone. Tim and Tim and James have made they're wise. These they're tremendous so points. Wise. <laughs> what I'll do, what I'll do is cherry pick the key Claim points my that they've said and put them <laughs> put them into an article and title it "Tim Hemming weighs in." <laughs> he he's a hundred percent right there, right? Like, isn't it? It, it, it? That that is yeah. that is the reality of pro racing at the moment. And, and I think the shining example is that that August Schmozel. And that's what I'm going to call it at this point. Like, why the fuck are there so many of these races? Again, we're talking about a global race series that has locations around the world that they can choose, which means not like you can put them any point of the year you want because there's always somewhere summer, and they're going. We'll do August, August. Like it, 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 it's it's silly to me. And I mean, again, I don't want to just keep banging on about the. I don't want to keep beating a dead horse or whatever. But it it does seem illogical to me. And this this is. The fundamental issue is that we still don't have any sort of joint narrative. It is these guys doing their thing, these guys doing their thing, these guys doing their thing, these guys doing their thing. You can see that Iron Man is now trying to take away lessons from the PTO. They're doing their their documentary series. They're trying to up their content game a little bit. You've got Challenge who's kind of trying to play nice, but they're still still doing their thing. And then you've got Clash is doing their broadcasting, which is kind of like what the PTO is doing, but they're not doing as good a job of it. They're not broadcasting races anymore. And you've got the PTO who started to do not their thing. Not actually broadcasting it anymore. Yeah, but then the PTO is doing their thing, but now they're trying to become more like Iron Man. And it's, it's, it's really just this, you know, that game where you put the cup with the ball and you sort of, it's becoming a little bit like that with me, like, which is the, which is the answer here? Because it's, again, like we follow the sport probably a lot closer than 90% of track, the triathlon fans do. And I'm fucking confused, mate. Like I sit there just going, what the hell is going on? And I, I, I like, I like that we see the PTO sort of trying to, that, like, I, I don't care what anybody says. They have put that race before 70.3 worlds to be like, pick. You can go and do the PTO race where you're going to make good money and get well televised and make value for your sponsors. Or you can go and win the 70.3 world title that's probably going to be barely televised. You're not going to make any money. Pick. Like it's it's time to draw a line of sand. That's why I've said this a hundred thousand fucking. But when you times. say bring value to the sponsors, don't you think that the sponsors still see more value in a seventy point three world title than they do a PTO event at this stage? Yeah, but also I think that what I'm seeing at least, and how I operate now as as a sponsorship manager, is that there's an increasing level of sophistication coming about how you measure value. So for me, for example, now one of the things I I have this platform now that I use for um, the Phoenix athletes that we sponsor that literally gives me a monetary value of the media that these athletes get for us. And it's not just through social media, it's through website mentions, it's through broadcasts. Like this thing spits out a number. And I would say that for me, the PTO is probably more valuable just because their broadcast is wider spread and... and, 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 and yeah, yeah. Like, that's, a sophist- that's a sophisticated way of thinking about it. Which I think but is, which I think is still stands, but I think is that everybody that's still happening. thinking in it, about it in that sophisticated level. Yeah, you're, not not all. Some sponsors still see. Yeah, but yeah. I'm seeing that more are. I think that there is starting to be the shift now because, okay. like, I didn't come up with this idea myself. A brand that I deal with as an agent who sponsors an athlete that I work with, they started. I'm like, fucking hell, that's a good idea, and I think that's how these sort of things start to happen, right? And I feel like we are starting to see that the the sponsorship side of the sport is becoming more sophisticated. I I think. That world titles from Ironman are, are still significantly more important than anything else out there. Like, there's no other race title in the sport at the moment that matters more. Roth being the exception of maybe Frankfurt, but it's still uh, Ironman World Championships, seventy point three World Championships. That's sort of it. Even I, even long uh, World Triathlon Championships don't matter that much at this point. I still think, uh, but like I, I, I feel like there needs to be more of an incentive or a focus around, as you say. Stop paying the bonuses. Give the athletes the ability to go and do the high high payday races. And then if they want to or not, that's fine. But we're not just going to reward you because you're going to do a whole bunch of races that have no benefit to PTO. Like there needs to be some actual fucking strategy behind these decisions instead of just fucking making it rain and giving out money. You get a car, you get a car, you get a car. I've said this a thousand times and I think it's it, 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 it's getting to the point where we're going to start to see some more and more changes happen because – like again, I, I I had this conversation with Joe Skipper the other day. He's like, I could theoretically never race a PTO event, and I could get paid a bonus from the PTO. He's like, that doesn't really make sense. I'm like, you're right. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. So I feel like they're going to eventually go. This doesn't make sense. Why do we? Why are we doing this? So things are going to have to change. But yeah, too many I races. Think, 
Tim makes an interesting point in the end of the article. He says, having received millions more in funding and bought the new private equity partners on board in December, as well as partnering with Warner Brothers Discovery for broadcast, the PTO has moved beyond its early um, early, um, early investments of Michael Moritz. The focus is narrowing on getting a return. And he said this last sentence is uh, is key to the whole thing, I think. He says, to succeed, they need to start by scheduling the right races at the right times. Yeah, I mean, it's a very simple sentence, but it kind of science. sums up the whole thing, doesn't it? Yeah. And I mean, the first thing I would, I don't know, there's a lot of people working on the PTO who are doing an amazing job and they're trying their best. I get it. And, uh, and it's not easy and it's easy looking in from the outside. But the first thing I think I would do if someone said to me, you've got to come up with a race series that's going to capture the imagination. I sit down with a calendar and look at when I could, where and when I could put races so that they would complement the existing ecosystem and not fight against things and make that job of getting athletes to those races as easy as possible. Here's, let's use an example of another sport. And it's, I know it's not the same, but F1, for example. F1 has, a, has an annual narrative of the same 20 athletes racing each other in different locations. What is it? 25, 26 races a year. And it works because every race, unless something goes wrong, the same 20 people are there racing the same thing, different course, same characters the whole time. There are comp- there are competitors, right, to F1. Like you've got the Indy, whatever. You've got different series, right? But you lock in those 20 athletes and that's the series. We don't have that yet. We don't have a system. in Super League sort of do it, to be honest. We're Super League contract the athletes and it's like you have to do all of our races or you don't get paid, which yeah. I think is the right approach. Like that's what I want to – that's what I keep get- – Fucking let's lock in a series and you have to do our races. None of this will just give away because we're fucking, we feel sorry for you guys not earning enough money. Fuck that. I'm sorry. Well, I think they were coming from a place. Um, I agree with you, but yeah. I think they were coming from a place of trying to gain some weight to be able to bring the athletes in. Do you know what I mean? They do you think that this worked? Do you were... think that they were still, like I said, do you think that they're going to, because again, I agree. That's what they've, 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 I agree with you, but I sit here and go, I don't think it's worked necessarily the way they want because you're still going to see, I said this, the people who are going to win a 70.3 world title are going to go do 70.3 worlds. The people who probably weren't going to win that title are going to probably go do the Singapore race. That's not what you want. You want the people who are the 70.3 potentials to be at the Asian race. Like, And I just don't think, I still don't think it's going to work because you're right. Those I'm more titles are worth more at the moment. I, I think the biggest problem triathlon has got, if I'm honest, is the um, is the fact that it doesn't, it's quite hard to make a decent living as an athlete as a, as a, within triathlon. So your focus is not on the betterment of the sport, but it's on your own survival and earning yeah, enough money. It's true. Um, uh, as soon as the, the, the sport gets to a level where, you know, number 50 in the PTO world rankings is earning enough to have a decent living, that's when you could start thinking, okay, well, you know, people, people a bit further up are going to start thinking, well, you know what, let's make this ecosystem better for everybody by trying to create a narrative and trying to create a fun, a fun thing for the audience to watch. Whereas at the moment, it's such a nightmare trying to scrape a living mm. through sponsorships, through a little bit of race winnings here and there that you're just like, fuck the ecosystem. I got to try and survive this thing. And I am, if I'm not racing this race, I'm racing this race. If I'm not racing that race, I'm racing that race. And it's they're not thinking about the, the bigger picture because the bigger picture is less important than putting food on the table. But it's also not, this is what I mean. I don't think that should be the athletes. Like that shouldn't necessarily fall on the shoulders of the athletes, right? There's an ecosystem in which the athletes exist and they can simply do what they can do. And again, I, I keep repeating myself here with, and I know that people go, stop saying all the time, Tim, you take away the end of your bonuses, you create some sort of development system for the, the athletes who aren't in the top 50 or the 20 to 30, whatever you want to call it. Top 20 athletes get the opportunity to go do the 20, P, the, the four or five PTO events every year. The prize money is a million dollars, 600,000, whatever it is, you get paid. That's how those top guys make the money. They still have their sponsors. They're still going to go do other races, right? But then you have some sort of system that is specifically for developing that lower tier athlete to bring them up to that level. You have the relegation system, whatever it is. That creates a situation you just mentioned, right? Like yeah. it's yeah, we've, me, nailed, to, we've nailed it. I mean, that's to me, it seems so obvious. It. And I'm just going, like, come on. Yeah. Like it, it, it's I just don't yeah. understand. Yeah, the, pre- the Premier League, the Premier League is the uh, is the top 20. Yeah. And they get to race in those in those top races. And they get paid They're more for it. To, and then and they get paid a because there's no bonuses being paid at the end of the year they get paid a fuck ton to do it and they're contracted to do it unless they're injured. Right. Did we, we solve it. it? 
We solved it. Yeah, Tim Tim Hemingway's in, but Tim and James are weighed in better. Correct. You heard it here first. James Bale, I think we're done for this week. If people want to find out more about MX Endurance, mate, what do they need to do? What you need to do is wait for me to scroll down. If you want to find out more about MX Endurance, head to mxendurance.com or search MX Endurance on Facebook or at MX Endurance on Twitter or Instagram. If you want to follow me, I'm at bale.james85 on Instagram. We can follow Tim at t fourteen on Instagram. Jump onto iTunes, give the show a review. You can do it in the podcast app. It's super easy and very helpful. If you like what we're doing, tell a friend to help us grow. If you've got any suggestions, comments, or criticisms, send an email to podcast at mxendurance.com. James Bale, a pleasure, mate, as always. Uh, hopefully your stretching goes well and you continue to touch your toes and master the da- downward dog. And uh, talk to you next week. Cheerio.